John. John. John, your your audio is off. Oh, can you hear me now? Yes, thank you. <laughs> yeah. I'm sorry, I was talking to myself. I was saying how great uh, Kathy and Phil were doing. Um, so what I was saying <laughs> was, was um, I think what Kathy and Phil just illustrated is that um, you know the HVAC industry is already entering another revolution. It's already gone through several prior revolutions. Um, and outside of uh, healthcare industry, like um, hospitals and infectious disease labs, health was not a, a design criterion um, for HVAC systems in transport, um, entertainment venues, hospitality venues, and so forth. And now it's starting to become a design criterion. And it, it, the pandemic started with um, a focus on, you know, increased outdoor air ventilation and increased filtration capacity. Um, and what they just described are technologies that are geared towards cleaning the air. And, you know, what, what I've been focused on with others, including faculty at Johns Hopkins, has been... Um, thinking what the next uh, the next evolution will be. And that, that next evolution is centered around the direction of airflow. Um, you know, as we, as we think about the, the direction of airflow, um, if, if we were in a space and if there were an infected person, um, uh, if, if air were blowing down the length of the space, you don't want the air blowing the germs from the infected person into the faces of other people. Uh, you wanna move the dirty air away from everybody um, and then get it routed as quickly as you can to, uh, you know, a filtration device or a cleaning device. And so ultimately, um, uh, there's, there are design solutions for this. These design solutions have existed um, in hospitals and infectious disease labs for decades, but now we're starting to see uh, for new facilities um, and new um, vehicles uh, opportunities to bring them into the environment. And, you know, as Kathy and Phil were saying, um, the platform that existed on rail cars to begin with was already offering significant advantages over a lot of indoor air, uh, indoor environments. And this is just a continual improvement process, right? Um, uh, building in the filtration, uh, getting into cleaning technologies, and then ultimately um, harnessing the direction of airflow so that we route the dirty air as quickly as we can to those technologies is where I think we'll get the ultimate outcomes for our human health when it comes to HVAC. We've all been washing our hands a lot. So I think of as a writer, as a customer, as an employee, the less you touch, the better. And Phil, you're doing some interesting things operationally with your laser technology. How that helps your employees who are responsible to keep the rails clear and clean. Tell us a little bit about that. Well, you know, the laser technology that we've applied, it actually is something we're very uh, proud of. Um, it was something that came about in 2018, talking with staff about trying to tackle longstanding issues. And in the rail industry, low adhesion due to fall season and the pectin that is left on the rails from the leaves being crushed has been something that railroaders have been facing for years and years and years. And, you know, the old tried and true method of using sandite um, that works to some degree, but it really just covers up the, the cause. Um, Power washing and pressure washing is something that is effective, but what we found is that laser technology had the ability to clean the steel um, down to bare steel and actually remove the pectin. What the challenge was in 2018 is that the technology was unproven and that the, um, it couldn't be run at a high enough speed for any railroad to want to try this out. So we sat down with the manufacturer and we said, let's work together. Let's get it to a speed where we can use it. And last year we did. Uh, and we showed tremendous benefit with regards to improving adhesion, improving safety, um, and that's safety for our riders, safety for our workforce. Um, and it also is reducing the need for addressing flat wheels and, and taking cars out of service. This year, um, we increased the speed. We got it up to 25 miles an hour. Now we're running it throughout the system. We added a second laser train and we're showing that uh, we further reduced it. We did not even need to use all of our uh, wheel truing facilities where we enhance it. So what we're doing is we're being proactive. Um, we're never going to get rid of mother nature. In fact, now we get to maybe enjoy some of the, the color changing along with everyone else. Um, but what we're doing is we're, we're actually paying for itself by using new technology. And what we wanted to do is ensure that we 
um, look at best practices, but maybe come up with some of our own. So we're excited about it. We're going to continue to work on this and, and see how it can be even improved for the future years. But you're talking about the touching part, and, and Kathy alluded to this, the train time uh, upgrade to our app that we have developed for our users, uh, both Metro North Long Island Railroad. It's both available on Android and iPhones, um, and it is one way to um, eliminate the need for uh, any other types of touching and things because right on your own phone, on your own device, you can find out um, where your train is, how crowded that train is, where it is before it comes in, and, and you can position yourself on the platforms before um, the train arrives. And, and in, in the COVID era, finding a car with less, more space is invaluable to people that want that sense of comfort. Yeah. Uh, you Absolutely. can also use it for predicting ahead of uh, and, and using historical travels. So you could pick and choose which trains you want to take. So it is really vital to the folks. And then it has a direct link to eTix, which obviously is another way to do things with less contact and less touching, purchasing your, your ticket in advance on your phone. Uh, all the things that we know were important to our riders before are important to our riders now moving forward. Uh, so these are the kinds of things that we're going to continually build out. Um, information is important and it's powerful to our folks. They can make informed decisions. And we know that um, the ridership now is, is um, really uh, important to us because it, in so many essential workers. But we also know that um, non-essential travel is important to quality of life. And we want people to feel comfortable. We want people to know that they can ride the railroad and do it safely um, and you know, those are the kinds of things that we're continuing to build out. We want people to know uh, when they're coming back, we'll be ready for them. Wonderful. So staying with touchless, Mike, touchless passenger service. You've been doing this for a while. Airports, trains, buses. Tell us more. Yeah. Hey, Melinda, thank you. Thanks for having Boingo and me today. And uh, it's great to be on this panel with everybody. Um, yeah, you know, it, it all starts with connectivity, and um, uh, and I we think it's converged and shared tech, uh, you know, uh, connectivity. So, not just license, uh, but also unlicensed. Most people think of as Wi-Fi, and a lot of new spectrum coming there, as well as hybrid, like CBRS, where you know you work with all the various entities uh, for for that to work. But that really enables these types of applications that Phil just highlighted and Kathy just highlighted, like train time where you can find your seat. People want to know they don't have to touch things as they come in. Uh, some of this has already been happening, as you well know, with ticketless travel. Um, if you're at an airport, you just put your barcode on and, and get through uh, uh, the gate and things like that. But we now need to enhance that more. And it's really gonna require um, always on uh, high speed, low latency type communications. You heard Tim talk about earlier, uh, but using all that technology together. So using cameras for identifying social distancing um, and security as well. Facial recognition uh, where you don't need to, you don't have to have, uh, you know, any touching concessions. You don't think of that as much, but if, if you want to get a, you know, a Coke and a hot dog to be able to get that without having to, to um, interact necessarily with, with people. Cleaning services, I think Phil and Kathy both highlighted that, uh, certainly for Rick in the airports, to be able to do that and off hours in an autonomous and maybe even a robotics that requires the connectivity to do that. Of course, health check screening, temperature screening, um, things like that. Digital signage, I think Phil and Kathy both highlighted that. Rick obviously mentioned it. It's a major part of uh, the airports. And then just kind of good old communication for staff and first responders to be able to communicate with each other. But before I just leave, I just wanna hi uh, highlight the incredible innovation that's going on in New York. Uh, what Rick highlighted with the airports and the job that he and the Port Authority have done is amazing. And we've had the opportunity to obviously work with Phil and, uh, and Kathy and the uh, MTA with uh, incredible innovation they're doing and, and technology is going to be underneath that. Thanks, Mike. Steve, Cubic Transportation Systems has been in the world of contactless for a while. And as we think about the world ahead, whether it's use of a smart card, a bank card, a virtual application, this is all what is now necessary in a COVID and post-COVID environment. 
My question to you though is, it's not just in the transportation environment, it's out there. And I think Tim called it connected communities. I like that. Smart cities, connected communities. How does what you do in transportation now go to the next steps, many steps across our communities? Thanks, Melinda, and I'm very happy to be here with everybody today as well. And uh, smart smart cities has, has been a kind of a term and a buzz phrase that uh, we've been kicking around. Everybody's been kicking around for a long time, and uh, we've made a lot of progress to help enhance uh, customers' experience and uh, to provide operational efficiencies for the uh, service providers. But really, sometimes with a, a, a great um, solution, you need a, a problem to really kick it in. And I think COVID-19 and the pandemic has kind of accelerated some of the some of the things we've all talked about for years on, on making cities smarter. And uh, so I think some of the stuff we're doing um, right now is um, certainly with the Omni system is kind of uh, fortunate that um, we're putting in a contactless payment system into the to the MTA. And uh, I think uh, with that, it's contactless, which is great. And uh, we certainly didn't think about that the pandemic was coming, why to make it contactless, but it's, it's more efficient uh, um, technology to use, but it also allows you to, uh, be, to be more safer, to, to operate safer as you don't, you can bring your own media right now. You can bring your own credit debit card that's contactless. You can use your own mobile phone. You don't have to go through, purchase something from somebody else who's touching things. And uh, it just cuts down on a lot of the, the physical contact uh, for safety. And like uh, Michael said, there's some other, other things that we can start combining technologies, really. Some of the stuff that Phil's and Kathy talked about as well, about capacity on the trains. We can tell in especially in subway stations and buses, how many people have gotten, have entered into the system. And we can combine that information with some of the information coming from these other systems uh, that Phil and other people have talked about, about capacity. And now we can really start providing people information about what they can do and where they, where they can best safely ride. And so we're also combining, uh, looking at putting in technology into fare gates that can um, use facial recognition or use to determine if people are wearing masks or not. Uh, we can take their temperature as we go, as they go through and enter the system. And so all that technology is, exists, exists now and can be built into your systems. But what I think some of the big challenges that, that we all face really and that the operators face is what do we do with that information? When we detect somebody's not wearing a mask and trying to enter into a fare gate, do we block them? Do we put a warning? Do we call security? What do we do? Or we take a temperature and the temperature is 101.2. Do we say you can't ride today, even though they may need to get to a doctor? So there's a whole bunch of operational uh, challenges that we have to go, that you have to marry up with this technology to really use it uh, um, effectively. Thank you. You know, I see a lot of really excellent, uh, real excellent questions coming over. So uh, I'm going to skip around this a little bit, but I'd like to go to public private partnership first. Uh, we are in a world where public transportation is experiencing a gap beyond anyone could have, what anyone could have imagined. Talk to me about the importance, in your opinion, of public-private partnerships, how you're using it today, what you think about it in terms of the future. And I'm just going to open it up and, and ask any of you, since we have public and private represented on this panel, to, to respond. Hey, this is Mike. I'll, I'll go ahead and start, Melinda. You know, Buenco, we, we've been doing uh, public-private partnerships for a long time. and. Um, it really is uh, the best way and a great way to work with partners and drive innovation. I highlighted that a little earlier about the innovation that's going on in New York with the great leaders that are there. And, and these partnerships really do a number of things. They're great engines for change. Um, they ensure that the public is front and center. You know, in any interaction in business, you have your companies and your people to worry about, uh, but it really does bring the public uh, front and center, um, the, the changes uh, become transformational. And um, I think the added uh, investment from all the sectors just amplifies um, the capabilities uh, that you can provide. I, I'd like to add that I think there's kind of two general definitions of public-private partnership that are floating out there. There's, there's the essence of collaboration, and then there's also a procurement mechanism. 
And um, the procurement mechanism is about um, when an agency does not have sufficient uh, capacity and or funding to construct a new piece of infrastructure. And an example would be a bridge. Let's say we have a bridge, it needs to be replaced and um, we don't have the, the time or money uh, to, to do it ourselves. So what we might do is we might pay a private sector uh, company to design the bridge, um, construct the bridge and pay for it. And, and in exchange to make it a win-win, um, uh, that, that contractor might keep all the toll revenue for the next 30 years. And in, 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 the, in those types of procurement mechanisms, there's, it always needs to be a win-win. It always needs to be a revenue stream for the, the private contractor that's going to deliver the work. And then there's always going to um, uh, you know, need to make sense for the agency. And, and I think to Michael's point, when it comes to um, like collaboration and innovation, there's no end, I think, to where uh, we can work between public and private sector. And I would lump academia in there. I feel like the academics from all these institutions around the world have been like super helpful um, uh, to all public agencies during this pandemic. And then when it comes to the procurement mechanism, I think it's important to acknowledge that it, it's not a silver bullet. There's gonna be a, a limited number of projects where it makes sense for everybody, where it truly will become a win-win. And there's a good amount of due diligence that needs to go into assessing and screening the different procurement methodologies out there to make sure that P3s would, would truly make sense for, for, for everybody in, 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 uh, in the right type of project. You know, Melinda, I'd like to add on to what John talked about. And, and you know, even um, in better days where the financial picture was um, uh, more robust, there was always a need to look for creative ways for financing. Um, and PPP certainly are um, traditional ways. Uh, but there's also other ways where, you know, we were working very closely with communities and, and, and developers um, because we know transportation really drives the economy and transportation is vital. And when you upgrade and improve transportation, we see the businesses around it improve. Um, and so a lot of things that where we talk with developers, it's, you know, how do they help us with these investments? And, and just an example of one that's ongoing right now, you know, the new station at Elmont that will support the new Belmont Arena is one that is paid primarily by the developer. Um, a small portion of it is being paid for the, by the state. Um, and, you know, perhaps traditionally in the past, the MTA might have funded things like this, but uh, we know that we needed to get creative. And there's a tremendous benefit to this station, to the developer and the arena. And in that case, you know, the private sector stepped up. And, you know, those are the kinds of opportunities that we will have to keep looking at because um, there's not always the ability to generate revenue for a PPP. Um, but certainly there are other ways that they can uh, reap the benefits of improved transportation. And we're, we're going to keep driving that. Um, and that's important to all of us because, you know, the, the improvements um, not only will sustain us through as we get out of this pandemic, but they're going to last long into the future. And that's, that's um, exciting stuff for all of us still. Great. Thank you so much, all of you. Senator, if I may come back to you, you know, you have a reputation for being the sounding board, the conduit for your constituents. And I know last year you held some meetings, hearings in Albany, really trying to get to the bottom of what the riders expect. My question is that input that you received last year, anything you're hearing today address much of what you heard? And do you believe that the input is the same as we go forward? Um, there are three ways to answer that question, but first, um, I just want to acknowledge that last year we held the most re um, robust schedule of transit oversight hearings and, and that had ever been held by uh, the state legislature. We went um, and we advocated with the labor, riders, um, transit advocates, and, and um, businesses uh, through roundtable discussions and meetings. We just didn't go do it in Albany. We went around the state. Um, we went up to upstate uh, and then Long Island and Westchester as well um, to make sure that we heard everything. The, the biggest issues that we heard and, and what people want is station accessibility. They want to um, increase funding to transit, specifically uh, capital funding. Uh, but the biggest thing that the folks also wanted to and that are concerned about now 
is uh, availability and accessibility to have one seamless system. That, you know, we have to rethink transit in a major way in the state. There shouldn't be a need for you to have to travel from Long Island to Westchester and have to use three different cards. Uh, it should be, I know that they're working, you know, towards it, but it should be one system. It, we need to make sure also that we lower fares, you know, that, that the MTA wants to talk about increasing fares and, and fine and, and tolls, uh, you know, in order to encourage transit, I believe, and I'm going to be working hard to talk about this throughout the legislature. And in fact, we're in conference today. I just snuck out of conference to participate in this panel. Um, but, but we need to make sure that we are looking at more um, uh, innovation in transit as far as connecting the systems and having interconnectivity. Uh, we started it in Queens with the uh, freedom ticket. We want to expand that uh, where we have a ticket that you can uh, either take a bus to get to the train and, and take the Long Island Railroad and straight into the city uh, for folks that are living in transit deserts like Southeast Queens and certain parts of Long Island. We need to do more to reconnect the bus system to the Long Island Railroad and to um, making sure that the uh, Metro North buses and, and, and the transit buses up in the Metro North area are better connected to the railroad in the North Country, where we have a lot of people that are actually on a New Jersey transit system. You now we need to improve that as well. So we need to figure out a way to um, actually, and then the other realization is with, with the overnight closures um, and also with the increased fares, once we went back to uh, paid service, there were a lot more people jumping turnstiles because they're not getting paid. They're looking for work. They can't afford the um, daily payment or even a weekly or monthly pass on the subway. So we have to take a longer look at what transit needs and what the uh, conditions are. Um, I just want to address the public-private partnership for a second. I think that those are critical. Um, the Elmont Station, I want to take full credit for developing. Just kidding. But um, you know, our, our communities have been fighting for the Elmont Station for a long time uh, because the Elmont Long Island Railroad Station is included. And um, like I see, uh, the, again, um, we need to make sure that those things are happening. And just to, on another comment, you know, the, I see where um, Eugene is talking about the Far Rockaway Long Island Railroad Station that gets excluded from programs. You know, we need to make sure that in our most impoverished area, like in Far Rockaway, that they can get a discount mobility program into, into the city, into the core, so that they can work. You know, we need to make sure that we create opportunities for people. And, you know, the, the REVEL programs and the alternate transportation programs are not out in the outer boroughs. We need to do more to integrate that as well. So the most, the biggest thing I heard from people, other than complaints about MTA management, which is a whole nother category, um, you know, is the ability for people to get cheaply and safely into the city in a one-shot way. And we need to work hard to try to make that happen. And we're hearing a lot today about the safety piece, public safety being at the forefront. And for that to happen, all of you, as Mike mentioned, it does sometimes start with the network. Whether you're an application, a service provider, a network provider, we all think every day about cybersecurity. I'd like to put a, a question out to the group how are you thinking about cybersecurity? What are some of the uh, innovations or initiatives you have in play to minimize or to address this culprit that impacts us all? Yeah, I'll, I'll go ahead and start, Melinda, if you don't mind this, Mike. Sure. Uh, so, you know, look, uh, it really starts with prevention planning and um, there isn't anything that we do or anybody does in a network today without starting with prevention of cyber and, the, and making sure that you can avoid those threats. And there's a lot of technology and capability, but as these networks open up and as there's more capability and licensed and unlicensed and CBRS and all of it coming together, um, there'll be more opportunities for those threats. But there's also a lot more capability today in the prevention of these threats, both in uh, the networks themselves, but also the software and the encryption and the capabilities that are happening behind the scenes. At Boingo, you know, we've been in airports and transportation hubs for a long time. Uh, we're on all the military bases. And so uh, that type of security is really right at the, the start of everything that we do. And I know a lot of the 
my colleagues that are here on the on this panel as well as the operators uh, that we work with have the same capabilities and the same desire to start there. Steve, yeah. I feel like I want to yeah ask yeah, you. Go ahead. Yeah. So I mean, security is definitely uh, top of mind for us and uh, dealing with payments. Uh, um, in the fair collection system. And uh, so we, you know, encryption of data and encryption at point of collection all the way through. And as, and as we collect data, we encrypt it. As soon as you tap your card or touch your card, um, we, we encrypt the data and it goes through many different uh, communication networks, com the MTA communication, our communication networks, banking com communication networks, but all that data is protected. Um, in an encrypted form and included and stored in the system. So we're always looking and there, there's new standards being developed as the world gets smarter, computers get uh, more powerful to, to hack different keys and stuff. Um, new standards are developed. So we we try and that the system we're putting in the MTA is at the, the highest level of securities available in the payment industry today. And so that's it's certainly uh, very, very important. How are we gonna get the riders back? Oh, go ahead. No, I was just going to add on to what Steve and Mike said, sure. Melinda. You know, the um, so true about the need for the planning um, and anticipation. It, it's it's really literally a, a constant effort to to stay uh, ahead of this. Um, and you know, there's so many things that we don't know what's going to come, but you need to be prepared. Um, and it's um, it's important for us to know that, uh, and for the public to know that this is. Uh, one of the top priorities for all of us. Um, the last thing we want is for uh, a security breach to impact uh, not only vital information, but to uh, maybe Im impact our, our riders directly, whether it's their own personal information, their own privacy, um, and um, you know, safety of our service. So uh, we're all vigilant with it. Um, and I think it's just like uh, even the pandemic, there's so much that we don't know still to come. Uh, but we're going to continue to stay on top of it and we're going to continue to work with all our partners uh, make sure that as technology starts to help us improve things that we continue to make sure that we um, you know keep all those doors shut and and protect all vital information how are we going to get the riders back what happens if riders decide they would rather zoom than get on public transportation what are your thoughts what are you seeing what is your messaging, Kathy? Yeah, I mean, so with respect to who is riding now, um, you know, it, it's been sort of interesting over the course of the last couple months. I mean, we are still seeing ridership down significantly in terms of people, sort of the traditional commuters, you know, getting on the train in Scarsdale and getting off at Grand Central. That ridership is still down, but we are seeing sort of pockets of hopefulness here and there. Um, construction workers were among the first people to come back. Uh, when the region started to reopen in the early summer, uh, and that ridership is strong. Um, we're also seeing pretty strong reverse commute ridership from areas like Fordham up to employment centers in White Plains, employment centers in Stamford, and also intermediate riders, people like sort of hopping on the train again at Fordham and getting off at some other station or getting on at Bridgeport and getting off at Stamford. So although we're not necessarily seeing the same riders in the same amount, uh, we are seeing interesting riding patterns that could provide the basis for starting to attract people back to the system. Uh, the one thing that I would also sort of point to, we did a survey. Um, I, I'll, there's a bit of an asterisk there because we did the survey over the summer. Uh, you know, that, at that point, we were anticipating a big surge after Labor Day. You know, employers were talking about bringing people back in January. Now we're sort of in a different place. Um, but there are still some takeaways in the survey that I thought were very interesting. Um, the survey went out to roughly 175,000 people that we had in our database for whatever reason. Um, and we got uh, roughly 22,000 responses back, almost 50-50 between people who used to ride but aren't riding anymore and people who are currently riding. Um, so with respect to the people who aren't riding anymore, 58% um, of those people said that they're gonna ride less in the future. Well, why are they gonna ride less in the future? 70% of those people said they're gonna be working from home at least part of the time. So that goes to your, your, your larger point. Are people just going to be Zooming forever? Mm -hmm. I, I, I sure hope not because, uh, you know, I, I think people sort of miss the, 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 the personal contact. 
Um, I think, you know, there's a fall off in productivity. I think it's more difficult to onboard new employees if they're never seeing the people that they work with. So I do think that work patterns have changed. And, uh, you know, I think it would be unrealistic to expect that, you know, we, you know when we come out on the other end of this, uh, that it won't be a bit different. Um, but I, I do think that, you know, when a virus becomes a virus, when a vaccine becomes available, um, and I think that, uh, you know, once we're sort of on the other side of this, I think we need to be poised to be able to find our customer, you know, take our customers where we find them um, and give them what they are looking for in terms of a convenient experience, uh, a, an experience that they find to be, um, you know, protective of their health. Um, in terms of what they cared about on the survey, 95% of them said they cared about social distancing. Uh, another 95% of them cared about knowing how crowded the trains were. So this is where it goes back to what Phil and I were talking about at the top of the meeting. I think we need to be poised to be able to give them the technologies that they need and the information, more importantly, that they need to feel comfortable about riding. Uh, and I think that we need to uh, you know, understand and expect the ridership patterns may be a little bit different, um, but that we need to be, you know, able to reassure them that the experience that they're having is a safe, reliable experience. Not everybody's going to be able to get in the car and drive to work anymore. Once the region is back in a big way, they're not going to want to sit in gridlock. They're going to, you know, there, there's going to be a point where the, the roads in this area are not going to be able to support all the traffic that, 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 that's going to be resulting from, you know, a completely rebounding economy. So we need to be there as the economy comes back. And we need to be able to show people that we're able to give them the, the tools to stay safe and to, you know, return to normal, whatever normal looks like on the other side of this. I'd like to um, add, oh, I'm sorry, Phil, go ahead. No, go ahead, John. Well, I, I was going to add that, um, you know, I, I think that a big question mark too is when, you know, we're going to return uh, to normal. And it's not so clear as just saying we have a vaccine you know, they're, they're, human behavior is the wild card here, right? It, each individual makes the decision whether they're going to wear a mask. Each individual decides after they leave work whether they're going to go to the backyard barbecue with their friends or indoors or not. And um, and, and most importantly, um, uh, individuals are deciding whether or not they're going to take the vaccine. And um, and 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 that. That one last item there is going to have the biggest impact on the timeline for when all of this gets unlocked and not just the transit ridership, but all aspects of our economy um, come back, right? And so, um, you know, every one of us has the ability to be um, uh, simultaneously working on the psychology aspect of this, as well as the physical aspect of this, and trying to uh, persuade uh, folks around us, even if they're fatigued, to do the, the distancing and the mask usage, uh, even on their own time, and more importantly, to understand the propensity of people to take the vaccine and uh, identify whether there's ways we can influence more people to, to elect to take it, um, because ultimately these things are gonna determine that timeline and unlock when all of this other stuff can be feasible. If I could just add to that, and. Um... You know, the, certainly the vaccine will play a big role in the future of, of ridership coming back. Um, and certainly businesses uh, should be more efficient if they can. And if you can telework and if you can do things remotely, uh, there's nothing wrong with finding savings and, and delivering things in that manner. But at the same time, I think a lot of folks realize um, there is a lot of benefit to the uh, direct interaction, the face-to-face. Um, the human element of things, and, and that will never go away. Um, we have seen uh, both Metro North Long Island Railroad that our ridership on weekends is has come back quicker. Um, so aside from the changing commuting patterns, uh, people will still use mass transportation when there's a place to go. You know, ourselves, we had several um, uh, tours to the East End to see the lighthouse, to go to the wine country, very successful. And we did it in a manner where people could social distance. We did it in a manner where we knew the places that we were taking people to could accept them. Um, and they were very successful. And, um, you know, we're currently running a promotion with New York City and Company and MasterCard right now to, to show people that if they want to go into the city um, and see the tree in a social distance manner and see the uh, holiday spirit, you can do that. And there's, um, uh, through MasterCard, you know, the uh, riders are, are given money back. 
uh, as a way to help them. And certainly, you know, long term, we know before the pandemic, uh, our ridership was growing in the non-commutation area. We were carrying 91 million riders, uh, but the, the the vast majority of the growth was non-commutation. So I believe when restaurants reopen, when Broadway reopens, um, and as Kathy mentioned, people are not going to want to sit in gridlock. Uh, people will get into mass transportation and other modes as well, and they should. Um, and, and then on Long Island, transit-oriented development was very robust and there is still that uh, piece of it that uh, future generations uh, don't have the same love affair perhaps that people had with the car in the past. Um, I do believe that it may take a little bit of time for people to get comfortable with um, the future, but once the vaccine is here and businesses start to reopen, um, I think everyone is itching to find a way to get back to some sense of normalcy. And quite frankly, mass transportation is part of that normalcy. Um, and it just will take a little time perhaps to get that comfort level back. Uh, but we're working hard on that. Um, you know, safe, reliable service, seamless service is important. Uh, and all of these things that we're doing from the train time to all the other innovations to Omni uh, is making it easier for people to use mass transportation. And, and that's, that's all of why we're all here talking about it, uh, because together we'll be able to, to find these solutions and address things as as they rise from people uh, bringing concerns to us. And this, this forum is perfect for that kind of dialogue. Absolutely. You know, you mentioned other modes of transportation and I did uh, want to ask about your opinion regarding micromobility. And it also is a question that came in from the audience. When you think about how e-scooters, e-bikes are growing and now with something called a pandemic, uh, there seems to be a, an air of safety around, right, not being in an enclosed space. Give me your thoughts, any of you, about how we should think about uh, micromobility in New York City. We also see, by the way, the city putting more lanes and, and areas in place to accommodate. I think there's a place for all of these modes of transportation, you know, coming from my previous job at the Department of Transportation, I always say this, you cannot build enough roads and bridges just for vehicular traffic, you needed to have a partnership with other modes and that's just not mass transportation, buses and trains and um, but bicycles, walking, um, these, these scooters, you know, today we're seeing a lot of them on the trains, a lot of people are buying the trains with different modes of uh, bicycles and scooters. Um, the main thing is that as this takes shape is how do we make sure that they all can coexist, that they can all be done safely, um, because we realize that uh, the, you know, there's a cultural change that has to take place. There are still going to be significant number of folks using personal motor vehicles. We're seeing that now. Um, and there's the challenge of how do you balance the need for the changing uh, use of, of other modes with the existing modes because it's it's not just an overnight thing and it has to be something where i think someone said earlier it has to be a win-win and at the end of the day um, if everyone were just using a car it would be total gridlock and, and the quality of life would just not be you know what we need it's it's a combination uh absolutely essential that we work together to support all those other modes and, and find a way to have it coexist that's my opinion yeah, I, 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 I think agree. people I want agree. to. I would agree because I'm, I'm sorry, I'm going to have to no, jump ahead, to my uh, conference meeting, uh, Melinda, because okay, I'm going to be gone for 45 minutes and we're over that time. Okay. Um, uh, but I would agree micro mobility is a necessary piece. I, I do um, have some concerns um, about the implementation of it without full community input. Uh, such as what was done on the Merrick Boulevard corridor in my district the other day, where they re effectively reduced uh, two car lanes to uh, just one, and they eliminated um, the ability for people to stop at the uh, uh, local stores uh, during rush hours, uh, during on um, the morning or afternoon hours, uh, to drop off their children in daycare centers, which we have, and to pick up uh, uh, something on the way. So we have to have real implementation of these things that are done with the community involvement because people in my community are, are, are hot about these bus lanes that were installed without increased bus service. So you, you, you can't just do one without the other. You can't put in uh, a bus and bike lane and you don't have a revel or, or a, um, 
any type of alternative um, transportation for people to take, and you just can't cut off the small businesses in the area either. So, you know, we have to, it can be done properly. Uh, it can be done in collaboration. It needs to be done, frankly, especially in transit deserts like ours. But again, I'm going to go back to what I said earlier. You know, we need to lower fares. We need to realign the buses to the, the uh, uh, rail system so that we can have more people that can uh, take the rail to increase lot ridership. We need to relook at transit in that way. And we need the public-private partnership to look at also uh, some capital issues. You touched earlier, I think, on the, um, the uh, air train from LaGuardia, uh, which needs to be redone. And uh, we need to make sure that we are working on this together. And, and, and it can't be done with just the agencies. It has to be done with the public involvement. It has to be done with real engagement. When one entity does it without involving the others, it doesn't work on a citywide level, but it definitely has to be done. And I'm Thank sorry you. I have to leave, but I'm actually, okay. we're, we're having our democratic conference today. And so thank you very much for asking me to be on the panel, but I have to go back. Thank you. Thank you, Senator. And I wanna thank our panelists and I'm heartened by much of what I heard today. Thank you all for your leadership, especially during this time. And thank you for taking what you're doing today and understanding what it means and how it applies to the future. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you, Melinda. Thank you, Melinda. Thank you. Be well, everyone. You as well, Phil. Thanks, everybody. Thanks so much, panelists. Uh, that was a really great discussion. Uh, Melinda did a great job moderating. Um, before we jump right into our second panel, I do want to take a moment to recognize our great uh, city and state intern, Kimberly Gonzalez, who is faithfully re uh, tweeting all the great uh, quotes from that first panel and from what Rick Cotton said earlier. Now I'm going to turn it over to my colleague, Jeff Colton, who is going to guide us through an hour long discussion on moving New Yorkers safely. Jeff. Zach, thank you so much for uh, guiding us in between these panels. I am Jeff Colton, a senior reporter at City and State and uh, somebody who focuses on the city government largely. And uh, that is also gonna be so much of our focus today is uh, moving New Yorkers safely. That is a broad topic. We're gonna be talking about biking. We're gonna be talking about uh, traffic deaths. We're gonna be talking about also uh, climate change and uh, the safety implications there. Uh, I think we have all of our panelists uh, on right now. Yeah, fantastic. So, uh, right, with, with that, uh, I've already warned them. I'm gonna give every panelist one minute to briefly introduce themselves and then uh, answer a prompt. And that's, uh, is the coronavirus pandemic more of an opportunity for safe transportation or a setback? So uh, with that, I will hand it uh, first to Eric Beaton. Uh, Eric, please introduce yourself and let us know what you think about the, uh, the coronavirus pandemic. Sure, Th thanks Jeff and, and thanks to City and State for having us and organizing this panel. I'm Eric Beaton, I'm Deputy Commissioner for Transportation Planning and Management at New York City DOT. Uh, and basically, the role I play at New York City DOT is our division is in charge of the things that happen on the streets of the city. And that's everything from from bus lanes and bike lanes and pedestrian plazas to making sure that we have uh, parking signs up. We have a, a million street signs around the city, making sure we have the markings down, uh, and, and working on uh, electric vehicles, working on, on our, our whole bike network. You know, I think a lot of the things that, that really affect transport, surface transportation in the city are coming through New York City DOT and are, are, are coming through uh, what I work on here. I've been at New York City DOT for about 14 years, past four of them in this role. And, you know, we, we've been through a lot of really interesting times when you think about Hurricane Sandy and the blackout and, and just the disruptions we've had to the transportation system. And, you know, COVID is, is going to be one of those that are up there where I, I think we've given people a chance to really reimagine streets and, and use them in different ways. And I think the public response to that has been really terrific. And we've 
broken a lot of new ground. But, you know, I, I have to say, like, at, at the same time, it's been a real a real problem when you think about, you know, in particular, the effect on, on the state and local budgets and our ability to continue doing a lot of these things. I think the, the MTA has, has very rightly gotten a, a lot of attention and, and you know, our, our ability to move this city is so incredibly dependent on the MTA's ability to keep operating, keep operating at, at the level that they are. But a lot of those same budget issues are hitting at the local level as well. I think it's been an interesting moment where perhaps the excitement level has been raised right when government's ability to deliver services is being reduced. And I think that's going to be the challenge that we really have to deal with moving forward. Thank you, Eric. And boy, I uh, I agree that the excitement level has been has been raised. It's always uh, it's always high. But yeah, there's issues there. Um, with that, Keith, please uh, introduce yourself and let us know: Is uh, coronavirus a an opportunity for safe streets or more of a setback? Okay. Thank you very much, Jeff, and thank you for having me. I'm Keith Kerman, the Chief Fleet Officer for the City of New York. New York City operates the largest municipal fleet in the United States. These are your police, sanitation fire vehicles, 50 different agencies. We are leaders in the Vision Zero kind of effort on the fleet and vehicle side, as well as a major sustainability initiative and electric vehicle initiative, which we want to talk about. I will have to say COVID-19 took the lives of two major Vision Zero leaders, Chief William Morris of the NYPD, the transportation head, and our own Lennon Fierro, the director of, of Vision Zero for fleet, so it gets set back, no, 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 nothing else from me. Um, but I will say one, one important thing. If COVID-19 as an experience for all of us is seen and responded to, not as a one in a hundred year thing that happens, but as the tip of the spear of what climate change will do and, and how difficult it would be for all of us to handle it if we don't stop and stop this direction now, then COVID-19 could potentially have a beneficial impact long-term, but it gets set back right now for me. Thank you, Keith. Uh, and council member, please introduce yourself and uh, let us know opportunity or, or setback. Well, I think, you know, every, uh, you have to turn every challenge into an opportunity, and this has been tremendously challenging. Hi, everyone. I'm Council Member Carlina Rivera. I represent District 2. That's the east side. I'm, I'm born and raised in the Lower East Side. I think, you know, the, the pandemic has wrought havoc on our city's public health, and that's plunged us into economic and, and social, social turmoil. But I think in this confusion, we've been able to reconsider parts of our life that we thought were long ago settled. And that includes the daily commute. In the last eight months, where we'll be entering our 10th month, really, we've been able to take stock of, I think, how the city was missing the mark in guaranteeing access to safe, reliable, equitable transportation for all New Yorkers. And it's given us a little bit of space to consider what I hope will be bold, proactive solutions to what are really decades old challenges. Uh, before COVID, we were failing to protect pedestrians and cyclists with fatalities going from over 100, 105 in 2018 to 126 in 2019. And we've seen those fatalities occur even during the pandemic with emptier streets. And now we're looking for new ways to invest in street safety. So it's, I think it's critical that we not only use this time to brainstorm new solutions, but we have to be fierce advocates for public transportation as well. And so as New Yorkers return to work, uh, they're going to be looking for alternatives to the subway. And that's walking, that's biking, that's uh, taking some of our public transportation, which is in desperate need of help. And they want to do that to work or to school. Maybe it's the scooters, maybe it's, you know, your Vespa, whatever it is, we have to make sure that we're working collaboratively. And I think it's up to us to ensure that people feel like they have a safe, reliable, and really most of all, affordable option. Thank you, council member. And I am so envious of your Christmas tree. I'm still waiting to put mine up, you know, maybe, maybe next weekend. We'll, we'll see. Uh, thank you, Frank. Uh, please introduce yourself and let us know what you think, opportunity or, or setback. Thanks, Jeff. 
Um, so just a quick introduction on myself, Frank Reed, CEO and co-founder of Rebel, uh, born and bred company here in New York City, born and bred New Yorker myself, uh, started operating here with a small fleet in 2018, uh, expanded to 1,000 mopeds in 2019, um, and currently we operate in seven markets across the United States, including Oakland, Berkeley, San Francisco, Austin, Miami, DC, uh, and four boroughs here in New York City with a fleet of over 6,000 mopeds. Um, in, in terms of your question, Jeff, about opportunity uh, or not an opportunity, I, I would say COVID is absolutely an opportunity. I think it's an opportunity to take back public space uh, and give it to pedestrians, uh, give it to bicyclists. Um, you know, some of the programs the city has, has rolled out recently that have been super successful from um, outdoor dining to the open streets program. Um, you know, the, the downside of all this, though, is, you know, essentially motor vehicle traffic is just where it was, uh, you know, pre-COVID, except a lot less people are commuting. Um, so what does that mean, you know, come May, June, as the vaccine is rolled out and we start going into warmer weather? Um, so I think it's obviously both an opportunity and there's also some headwinds I think we're going to have to deal with and uh, policy can obviously help a lot of that. Thank you, all of you. Uh, and just a note to all of our attendees, uh, please do. I see some action in the chat. Please be sure to, uh, you know, keep adding to that, have conversation there. Make sure that you do uh, add to panelists and attendees, though, so everybody can see it, not just the panelists. Um, and also, please ask questions in the Q&A at the bottom of the Zoom. Um, I'm planning to pull from some questions there uh, towards the end of this conversation. So type in, uh, if you have any actual questions, type them in there and uh, upvote your favorite ones. And uh, I will pick from that list. Uh, but I wanna keep on this conversation about uh, you know opportunity versus setback. Uh, and I was interested when I was talking to Eric at the Department of Transportation before this, uh, he was saying that, uh, look, it's a little bit uh, difficult, you know, that, that a lot of people think, why can't we just change the roads right now, you know, especially earlier in the pandemic when traffic was lower, isn't this an opportunity to transform the whole city? Um, but I think Eric was saying that there, you know, the, how much COVID has affected uh, the agency and uh, of course the city budget. I think we all know there are some serious issues there. So I'd like to start with Eric and then, you know, as we're talking about the budget and opportunities there, I uh, would like to hear from the council member as well. Sure, and you know, I think you know, May, March, May, April, like was is was a really incredible time, and not in a good way for for all of us here in New York. And you know, we we were an agency and a, and a city government that essentially didn't have a work from home policy. People didn't have laptops or any any you know real setup for working from home. And there and there was a moment where we had to spend time even just figuring out how we were going to, to set up a remote work site. We had to figure out how we're going to keep our, our basic daily functions working at, at a time when the city was was shut down. And you know, I, I don't want it to be lost like how you know, we had to really retool how we did business and just and be able to shift to a work from home setup in a way that we were entirely not prepared to. And then immediately pivot and turn around and realize that how important the streets are to making sure that the that New York City could recover and be able to, to start doing things like our open streets program, our, our open restaurants program, which you know, has about 10,000 restaurants that were able to open when otherwise they'd be shut, you know, which, which I think people think of as, as places for people to eat, but just it's places for people to work. It's places, you know, it, it's really tricky to keep the economy of the city going. And doing this all at a time when when we still don't have uh, functioning offices, we still have have are figuring out how to run an operation that's very hands on through a social distancing lens, and do it all through a city budget that is is far reduced. And it's why we're we're we're, we're juggling those kind of two competing tensions of COVID. That it is as the council member and others said, this remarkable opportunity, and, and we want to make sure we're we're taking that momentum and all the excitement and just being able to use our streets in, in totally new ways and, and expand and, and do it in a way that's equitable and reaching the whole city. And at the same time, do it with fewer people and fewer resources. And you know, we, I'd be lying if I said it wasn't a struggle. And I think we've done some really remarkable things. 
But we're, I think we're going to have to figure out how to make some of those things permanent and how we do it in a, in a very different physical and financial climate. And, you know, to say that we haven't figured it all out isn't to say that we're not going to. Uh, but I think working in a COVID environment, you know, people sometimes expect government to be like the water tap where you, you turn it on and we're, and we're there for you. Absolutely try our best to do that. But it's been a real struggle this year. And, and you know, it's, I, I think we always want to do more with less, but that's that's not always a straightforward thing to do. Right, and council member, I mean, are you and your colleagues asking uh, for various street redesigns and having to be told, you know, sorry, we just can't do it right now? What's the situation from your perspective? It's a couple different things. You know, we passed the, um, one of the bills that we passed in the council was to do this street redesign checklist. And we did that under the guidance of, with the guidance of, of transportation advocates and uh, family for safe streets, families for safe streets. So that was important. I think every time we repave a road, which has continued to happen through the pandemic, that's an opportunity right there to look at how we could redesign the street to be friendlier for pedestrians first and then for cyclists and for public transit. And in my district, we have the first ever busway, which has been proven to be highly successful. And I'm hoping uh, that the mayor kind of keeps to his word as much as possible in implementing those in other parts of the city. You know, with the budget, it's gonna be difficult. Um, it is probably gonna be one of the worst fiscal crises we've ever faced as a city, at least in decades. And there are a couple bills that I have and that we've also passed that I hope will be implemented, right? So we had this, the street master plan um, that we passed that had miles and miles of bike lanes. Um, I have a bill for an office of active transportation and that's to really have someone that's looking at bikes and, and scooters and motorcycles and everything else, the little razors that people are on using on the sidewalk and we can get to enforcement in a second. And you know, someone mentioned in the chat motorcycles. I think that's a very big deal. I see a lot of people on motorcycles. I think that they are kind of forced to kind of adhere to a, a set of rules that hasn't really taken into account some of their needs. I'm trying to work on legislation around that. And then we saw during the pandemic with the, the delivery workers, how even in a pandemic, those cyclists, those people were still needing protected bike lanes and infrastructure that kept them safe. And so now we have to make sure we deliver that justice as well. Something that I think is low cost, which was brought up, which I think is important, that is like very, I don't wanna say that it is gonna utilize fewer city resources because you don't wanna wholly depend on volunteers, though we do have models of the city that work like community boards where there are volunteers. At the beginning of March, none of us knew what social distancing was, right? But we figured it out very quickly um, that it would be very difficult to keep one another and our city safe on what are normally bustling streets. So in April, I introduced legislation in the council to, to close the streets to traffic, open them to pedestrians and cyclists. That was open streets. That would eventually become open restaurants, hopefully open culture, open schools, open stores. So I think we took that idea and we really ran with it. I think it's been a critical part of the city's economic recovery, as I mentioned. And I think when, what we saw specifically in my district is that we have a coalition, it's called the Loi Saida Open Streets Community Coalition. And that model's actually been replicated in parts of like North Brooklyn, where there's like programming in the streets for kids, for residents that feel cooped up in their apartments. And that requires very little maintenance from the city and is actually done without NYPD enforcement, but they need support too, right? Putting on programming isn't free. I think furniture in the streets and, and, and sign, signage is very important. Those things cost money, maybe not as much as you know, having officers and DOT employees manage the space but we certainly wanna show some respect and honor the work of the volunteers by supplying what we can. So hopefully um, as exciting as that is, there's still a long way to go. And we'll be working with the mayor, the Department of Transportation, especially with disenfranchised communities uh, to determine what they need to make their streets safer. And hopefully having some of these open streets uh, remain permanent. Yeah, well, actually, well, we'll come back to open streets. I definitely wanna talk sure. about that in the future, but, but one somewhat connected uh, issue here is, is speed limits. Uh, I just saw some coverage of the city of Paris uh, dropping many local speed limits within the city to the equivalent of, I think, roughly 20 miles per hour. 
uh, you know, we saw a change not too long ago. I think it was under the de Blasio administration moving down most city streets to 25. There's definitely been a push at the local level to even further drop that. And I think, uh, you know, this time during the COVID pandemic would potentially be an opportunity there. Um, I want to, uh, I guess, to bring in Keith for this, uh, but also hear from, from Frank, who uh, has definitely talked about speed limits before. But Keith, you know, are there, is there discussion at 